It was about 20 years ago that a high school freshman won a state science fair with a very interesting science project. And what he did was this student circulated a petition in the community and in that petition he explained the truth about what he claimed was a very dangerous chemical compound and he claimed that this chemical must be banned immediately because it is involved in a number of harmful products. He laid out the facts about this chemical compound and if you are um, have more of a scientific mind, see if you can figure out what this is. The first one he said is excessive consumption of this compound can cause severe vomiting. Number two is this compound is a major component in acid rain. Number three is as a gas, this compound can cause severe burns to the skin. And lastly, number four is that this compound has been found in all tumors of terminal cancer patients. So after explaining the health risk of this compound that he called dihydrogen monoxide, he asked 50 people if they would sign his petition to ban this. Well, his results were that 86% <coughs> said they, they would sign the petition to either ban or strictly control dihydrogen monoxide. 12% were unsure if they should sign it or not, but only one out of the 50 people realized the trick and did not sign it. You see, the chemical that he called dihydrogen monoxide is a scientific name where di means two. You have two hydrogen atoms and monoxide is one oxygen atom which is also written as H2O, which is also called water. <laughs> so water is the common bond in all of these things that he listed. Uh, excessive consumption of water can cause you to vomit. Excessive consumption of water is a major, or water is a major component in acid rain. Uh, as a gas, if you have the steam is too hot, it can cause burns to the skin, and water is found in tumors. <coughs> so, these people, 86% of them, agreed to ban water. <laughs> now, what this astute student illustrated so well in his project is how we oftentimes want to believe a person who is in a position of leadership or authority. The science fair winner was an authority on the subject of dihydrogen monoxide because he had all the facts. Despite that, he shows how we can still be so easily misled. Last week, we had talked about how the Israelites rejected God by demanding to have a king. And they wanted a king that they could see and feel and touch. As we read through the book of 1 Samuel, you detect subtle clues in the author's writing about what is going to happen is not very good. The author drives home the point that God's own people have now rejected him as their king, so do you really think that what follows is going to be sunshine and roses? It is not. If you remember your Old Testament stories from Sunday school, you might remember that earlier in the history of the Israelites, they were led by judges, such as the strong Samson, who killed many of the enemy Philistines. Well, as they say, second verse, same as the first. The Philistines now were back for revenge, and this time they had the Israelites outnumbered on the battlefield. We will pick this story up now in the book of 1 Samuel, and we will, if you're following in your pew Bible, you'll find the beginning on page 198, and we will be reading the first 14 verses of 1 Samuel 13. And the word of the Lord says, 
Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel, 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Giva, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to, to fight Israel, and with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets, among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. The Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Look at the situation that the Israelites are in now. They have rejected God. They put their trust in a mere man as their king. And now they find themselves outnumbered in war. The king is leading an unorganized army. They have no spiritual leadership whatsoever. The situation is not good. And actually, it's very serious and very bleak for them. Without God's protection, their first inclination is to run and hide out of fear. The Bible tells us that God is love and that perfect love drives out fear. Therefore, those who don't have God also don't have love, but they have an awful lot of fear. These fearful people were led by King Saul, and I think Saul is a fascinating character study. He represents many things, but today we will see Saul as a person who knows that he needs God, but he doesn't quite know how to access him. He comes really close to God at times, but for a variety of reasons, he just doesn't quite get there. And his is a very tragic story on many levels. One of the things we see in the passage is that Saul takes matters into his own hands and he disobeys God in two different ways. First, he goes against the wishes of Samuel, who Saul was sworn to obey by God. And the second is that Saul acts as a Levitical priest, which he is not. This is the first chance that Saul had as king to prove that he trusts God. And he clearly shows that he does not trust God at all. You see, the army was outnumbered, and the priest Samuel is nowhere to be seen. This is why I say that Saul represents a person who doesn't quite know how to access God, 
because Saul knows that the circumstances are very dire and he knows he needs God's help but he just doesn't know how to do it now if it were you what do you think you would do would you take your chances and go into battle without God's blessing even Saul knows that that is not a very wise choice so herein lies the problem he can't go into battle without God's blessing but if he waits longer for Samuel to come and to properly get God's blessing then he risks giving the enemy even more time to organize their forces against his army thus putting them at an even greater disadvantage Saul is as they say in the right church but the wrong pew he knows it would be suicide to go in the battle without God's blessing but he decides to take matters into his own hands and all too often I hear people saying whenever they're debating a certain course of action that they can't agree on they end up saying well we've got to do something well when I hear this I think that really makes no sense at all to just do something I mean just doing something isn't necessarily going to solve the problem let's assume as an example that I am with some friends in a boat off the Atlantic coast fishing very unlikely scenario I admit but it is an example <laughs> and let's say the boat motor dies okay now we can't get, get out of the water now when the screaming and waving our arms for an airplane that goes by does no good what if someone says let's swim for sure well I would say but I can't swim <laughs> what if he would respond but we've got to do something <laughs> well it makes no sense because if I try to do that I know I'm going to die <laughs> so at least sitting in my boat gives me a chance it's another case where doing something in haste can often be worse than being patient in waiting for a better opportunity to come around so in haste Saul assumes the role of a Levitical priest which he is not qualified to do but he offers a sacrifice anyway and Saul thought that, that he was sacrificing to God by doing this but through his disobedience he's actually sacrificing against God because it is all about God's will is similar to praying outside of the will of God do you think that God is going to answer a prayer that is offered with no regard to his will whatsoever that's how people often go through the motions in their religiosity but they do so in vain you feel good that you did something about it but um, it really gets you nowhere you may be familiar with Pastor Eugene Peterson he is the author of the Bible paraphrase called the message and he writes about these kind of things that people want to do in their Christianity and he calls them sprinkling holy water on a cabbage patch doll <laughs> he has quite a way with words if you read the message you'll pick that up very quickly basically what Peterson is saying is you think you're doing something really good but it really has no effect whatsoever in the case of Saul he's even what he's doing is even worse than this because his actions made matters worse what, bo what it boils down to is that if Saul had a very close relationship with God then he would have trusted that God would deliver him and his army from the enemy regardless of the circumstances just like God delivered Moses and the Israelites from Egypt by parting the Red Sea they were outnumbered but here's the thing if Saul had trusted God that wouldn't matter it wouldn't matter that they were outnumbered God is so much bigger than all of our circumstances that seem to be crashing in around us all at once and this is the danger of thinking from a worldly perspective and not from a godly one as I said earlier the tone of the narrative when 
you're reading through it, it's such that um, you're expecting something bad to happen now because they have rejected God. And Saul has just enough impatience to prove that he doesn't trust God. You see, in verse 10, it doesn't say, sometime after he finished presenting the burnt offering, Samuel shows up. No, it says, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, Samuel shows up. Samuel, or Saul, had just finished the offering. The offering was still burning whenever Samuel shows up. Saul came so close to passing that test, but he still failed. And speaking of patience now, in the animal kingdom, do you know which animal is known as one of the most patient animals out there? No animal matches the Siberian tiger in terms of patience, and humans aren't even anywhere close to the tiger. You see, tigers, these Siberian tigers, are very solitary animals. So they, they don't hunt in a pack like wolves, for instance, would. Therefore, the Siberian tiger's survival depends on its ability to be patient when it's stalking its prey. It is so patient that when the tiger is on the prowl, where it takes one person to cover a certain distance in one minute, think of how far you can walk in one minute, this tiger will take 20 minutes to cover that same distance. And it does that because it knows it has to be as silent as possible, careful not to crunch any leaves or twigs with its 500 pound body. What's more fascinating is that God instilled these instincts into the tiger, and it is so smart that it pays attention to the slightest breeze that is blowing, and it knows that if that breeze carries its scent in the direction of its prey, it will alert that animal, the tiger, and it will run away. Once the tiger closes into about 50 feet or so of a deer, an antelope, or even a small rabbit, it lunges in for the attack. And if the Siberian tiger is not patient and doesn't go through this routine for every kill, it's not going to have enough kills to survive. Now look back at King Saul now. He was not patient either, and his impatience cost him his whole kingdom. Let's turn our attention to the prophet Samuel now. Imagine what must have been going through his mind when he arrived. He knows that there is one thing that King Saul is not permitted to do, and that involves fire, lighting the offering. But when Samuel comes, he smells smoke. And I'm sure he's thinking, this is bad. Okay, I smell smoke, there should not be any. Now, once again, think back to your Sunday school, okay? Setting this time is in the Garden of Eden, and Eve offers a fruit to Adam, and he eats it. What does God say to them? The very same words that Samuel says to Saul, what have you done? One chapter later, from in, in Genesis, Cain kills his brother Abel. What does God say? What have you done? You see, in Genesis 3, Genesis 4, and 1 Samuel 13, we have the same question, and in each instance, it elicits a very similar response. Adam blames Eve, who blames the serpent, and Cain blames God for giving him a harsh punishment. We call this the blame game, don't we? And it's everywhere. Now, Saul follows suit, and he immediately gets defensive. It's not my fault, is what Saul is saying. He blames his army first, he blames Samuel second, and he blames the enemy third, saying, when I saw that the people scattered from me, blame my army, and that you did not come within the day appointed, I'm going to blame Samuel now, and that the Philistines gathered at Michbash, and I'm going to blame the enemy, it's everyone else's fault but I'm the innocent victim here. 
When we read this, we could almost think Saul were alive today, couldn't we? The way people want to blame people for the things they do. I'm sure you've all seen someone who was caught doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And then the backtracking starts. You listen closely to their words and they give themselves away, just like with Saul. He says, I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Why did he feel compelled? Was God compelling him? Certainly not, because his actions were diso disobedient to God. Without coming out and saying it, Saul is admitting that he acted impulsively and he was just being ruled by his feelings. He was not using his mind, he was using his heart. And we think of using the heart often as a good thing, but when God is not at the center of your heart, then that's a problem. It's sort of like relying on the light switch on the wall whenever the power goes out. Okay, I'm going to go over and put the light on. Nothing happens. He was doing everything that he could do without having God's backing. If Saul were using his mind, he would have remembered that there are other things that he could have done in that circumstance. Uh, two things in particular, he could have... Uh, uh, he could have prayed, could have prayed to God. Nothing wrong with that, you know, and that's the first thing he should have been doing. Also, Saul could have fasted. That's another thing that isn't done very often, but is something that uh, believers should consider doing every now and then, to draw yourself closer to God. There was only one thing that he couldn't do, and that's the thing that he did. I want to close out with this, that people, theologians and people who write on this kind of stuff, debate whether Saul, King Saul was saved or not. And the fact is, we know that he was chosen by God, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was saved, because God uses unbelievers for his purposes all the time. The Bible doesn't clearly tell us if he was saved or not. I think that is a good thing that we don't really know because that way we have every reason to apply the lessons that we learn from Saul to both the Christian and to the non-believer who is seeking God. Having said that, I don't just want to stand up here and preach a message that you've heard a thousand times before saying trust God when your back is against the wall. Okay? Well, it's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? And from experience, I can tell you that that is not an easy thing to do. And honestly, it's an area where I often struggle with that as well. I'm going to assume that most of you struggle with trusting God also. But despite my tr struggles, I can tell you that God has never once in my whole life let me down, nor do I ever expect him to. There are times when I've had to be patient and that has served to grow my faith. And I can't, I can't stand up here either and say that I passed the test every time because I certainly haven't. But I have learned, and this passage confirms, that making excuses for our sins and the things that we do doesn't accomplish anything. And it keeps us from addressing the real problems in our life, which in this case, in most cases, is sin. If you have sin in your life, and that would be everyone here, this applies to you. It is impossible to truly repent unless you admit that you have sinned in the first place. In the passage, Saul did not repent here. And as we dig deeper into his life, we will see how these issues of sin that he never addressed festered and they sent him in a downward spiral for the rest of his life. As a Christian, I urge you to prove that you are capable of better than Saul. And you can be better when you learn to trust God. Let us now go to him in prayer.